Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join me. I am Dr. Benjamin Shu, Chief of Glaucoma here at the USC Roski Eye Institute. Today, I'll be talking about site saving glaucoma research update here at USC. Before we start, I'd just like to thank all of you for taking time to attend. Unfortunately, we can't greet you in person, but hopefully, you'll find this talk to be useful. For those of you who are here in person, please uh, refrain from using the raise hand feature. Uh, this is just for HIPAA compliance. And if you have any questions, feel free to email Sylvia those questions during the talk, and I'll try to answer them uh, at the end of the talk. Great, with all that having been said, let's proceed. I'd like to start just by telling you a little bit more about myself. All of you know that I am a glaucoma specialist and I take care of patients both in the clinic and in the operating room. I also spend time teaching residents and fellows, and I also act as the assistant residency program director here. The other half of my time is spent conducting scientific research, and this is funded by the government, and this research is what I will be talking to you about today. Before I dive into my research, I'd like to provide some information about glaucoma. Glaucoma is an irreversible disease of the optic nerve. The optic nerve sits in the back of the eye and connects the eye to the brain. It transmits visual information so that we can see. When this optic nerve is damaged by glaucoma, there can be permanent vision loss. In fact, glaucoma is the most common cause of permanent vision loss worldwide. It's estimated that glaucoma affects currently around 80 million people. Four million of those people are here in the United States. Glaucoma disproportionately affects the elderly with 3% of all patients over the age of 50 having some form of glaucoma. Because of the very important role that age plays as a risk factor for glaucoma, the prevalence of glaucoma is rapidly rising as the world's population ages. The treatment and management of patients with glaucoma is costly. It's estimated that around $3 billion per year is spent in direct costs and lost productivity. Glaucoma currently is a disease without a cure. Therefore, early detection and prevention are key as they are the only way to prevent vision loss related to glaucoma. Glaucoma has a characteristic pattern of vision loss. Here on the left, we can see a perfectly healthy optic nerve. It's round and pink. And here's the corresponding normal visual field. When there is moderate glaucoma that is damaged, the optic nerve, there tends to be vision loss that only affects the peripheral field. Most patients do not detect this early vision loss. And it's not until this vision loss begins to encroach on the center part of the vision that patients are aware that they have this disease. Unfortunately, by this point, there is severe permanent damage to the optic nerve. Intraocular pressure or IOP is a very important risk factor for glaucoma. If you imagine your eye is kind of like a kitchen sink, it has a faucet that is constantly producing a fluid called aqueous humor that fills the eye. The eye also has a drain called the trabecular meshwork that takes this fluid away and the production and drainage of aqueous humor must be balanced. Otherwise, aqueous humor pools inside the eye, causing high intraocular pressure. This high pressure compresses the optic nerve and causes it damage in the form of glaucoma. This diagram illustrates the flow of aqueous humor inside the eye. The ciliary body is the faucet of the eye. It produces aqueous humor that flows between the iris and the lens to enter the front of the eye. There, the aqueous humor leaves the eye through the drain or the trabecular meshwork, which is located in the anterior chamber angle. This angle is formed by the junction between the cornea and the iris. Angle closure is an important anatomical risk factor for glaucoma. In angle closure, the peripheral part of the iris comes into contact with the trabecular meshwork. In this way, the drain of the eye is covered and the aqueous humor that is produced inside the eye cannot leave the eye. As aqueous humor builds up inside the eye because of the angle closure, 
This can lead to high intraocular pressure and over time to angle closure glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma is a common form of glaucoma and angle closure contributes to approximately a quarter of all cases of glaucoma or around 20 million cases worldwide. And this is the form of glaucoma that my lab researches. Let me briefly summarize the problem that we face in the field of angle closure. If we know that a patient has angle closure, we have many effective treatments for this patient that include laser and surgery. These treatments can widen the angle, thereby eliminating the risk of glaucoma in patients with angle closure. The problem arises when we cannot identify the patients who have angle closure, as angle closure does tend to be somewhat rare amongst the general populace. This raises the question, how do we identify patients who have angle closure who are at risk for angle closure glaucoma? Currently, gonioscopy is the standard for evaluating the anterior chamber angle to detect angle closure. In gonioscopy, a contact lens is placed on the surface of the eye. An eye care provider can look inside this contact lens in order to visualize the anatomical structures within the angle. The key anatomical structure that we're trying to visualize is this middle brown band here, which is the trabecular meshwork or the drain of the eye. Here's a picture of a patient with angle closure. You'll notice that none of these anatomical structures are visible. When we detect a patient with angle closure, we tell them that they are at risk now for glaucoma due to a risk for high intraocular pressure. Gonioscopy as an examination technique has several limitations. First, it is subjective and expertise dependent. Even between trained glaucoma specialists, there is only limited reproducibility in the detection of angle closure. Gonioscopy can also be uncomfortable and time consuming for some patients as a contact lens has to be placed on the surface of the eye for several minutes. Therefore, there is an urgent need in the field of glaucoma. And that need is for automated methods to detect patients with angle closure. I believe that the solution to this current dilemma is a form of technology called anterior segment OCT, or ASOCT for short. ASOCT is a non-contact, non-invasive form of eye imaging. It's able to produce beautiful high-resolution images of the eye and the anatomical structures inside the eye. Here we can see the cornea, which is the clear window into the eye, the iris, which is the brown part of the eye, and the pupil, which is the hole in the middle of the iris that lets light into the back of the eye. The lens in the eye focuses this light onto the retina so that we can see clearly. And here you can see on both sides, the angle, which is where the drain of the eye is located. My lab recently asked this question, can analysis of anterior segment OCT images be automated to detect patients with angle closure? To answer this question, we turn to artificial intelligence or AI. Broadly defined, AI is when computers are taught cognitive functions such as learning and problem solving. AI has gained a lot of publicity recently and holds the potential to revolutionize healthcare. AI can help increase accessibility and reduce costs of care, which will become increasingly important as the number of patients requiring care increases over the next several decades. Deep learning is a popular form of artificial intelligence. And deep learning has been used to automate image analysis for the detection of various diseases. Deep learning has been widely applied in all fields of medicine. For example, in this study, researchers developed a deep learning algorithm that can analyze smartphone photographs of skin lesions. The algorithm can tell if the skin lesion is malignant or not, and it can do this at a level that is equivalent to that of a board certified dermatologist. Let me briefly explain how an artificial intelligence algorithm is trained or developed. First, we start with the untrained algorithm. This is a series of interconnected computational nodes. In this example, we're training this algorithm how to differentiate between pictures of cats and dogs. First, to train this algorithm, we have to show it 
many, many thousands of pictures of cats, each with a corresponding training label that tells this algorithm that this is a picture of a cat. Next, we show it thousands of pictures of dogs, each with a corresponding training label telling the algorithm that this is a dog. By doing this thousands and thousands of times, the algorithm learns to extract features from these images and determine the weights of those features in order to determine if a picture is of a cat or a dog. Once an algorithm has been fully trained, we can show it a novel image that it has never been exposed to and ask it, is this a picture of a cat or a dog? And if we have a well-trained algorithm in this case, it will be able to tell us that this is in fact a dog. We applied these artificial intelligence algorithms to data collected here at USC. There was an epidemiological study conducted in the local uh, San Gabriel Valley in Monterey Park uh, between the years 2010 and 2013. USC investigators recruited over 4,500 participants all over the age of 50. And all of these participants received complete eye exams, including gonioscopy, as well as anterior segment OCT imaging. We used this data to develop our AI algorithm. The way that we did this is we had 4,000 anterior segment OCT images from patients' eyes. Each of these images was paired with a label that taught this algorithm whether the angle was closed or open. As we exposed the algorithm to more and more of these images and gonioscopy labels, the algorithm learned to identify angle closure in the anterior segment OCT images. We then tested this algorithm using this data from the epidemiological study. And what we found was that the OCT imaging plus the artificial intelligence algorithm was able to detect angle closure just as effectively as a human examiner performing manual gonioscopy on patients. This study was very exciting and well-received and was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. More recently, we have been validating the utility of this algorithm in independent clinical sites. We tested this algorithm in Singapore in a community-based clinic that sees hundreds of thousands of patients every year. Through collaborators there, we were able to recruit 1,200 patients and scan them with this anterior segment OCT machine and detect angle closure. The reason why we chose Singapore is that angle closure is especially common amongst Asians, and there's a high prevalence of Asian patients in Singapore. We also replicated this study here at the USC Roski Eye Institute, where we recruited 100 patients from the local neighborhoods. This was a much more diverse patient population, and patients were of a multi-ethnic nature. What we found in both of these patient populations was that the algorithm performed just as effectively as in the original patient population in which the algorithm was developed. We published these very exciting findings in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, and I just want to congratulate Jasmine Rondawa, who is a very talented second-year medical student here at the Keck School of Medicine, who spearheaded this study. More recently, we've been also conducting other studies using artificial intelligence to automate the evaluation and detection of patients with angle closure and deepen our understanding of how these artificial intelligence algorithms work. I've had the fortune of working with Michael Chang, who is the lead research assistant in my lab, as well as Alice Shen, who is a very talented third year ophthalmology resident. Let me briefly explain how these algorithms might be employed in the future. My vision is that these algorithms can be loaded onto an anterior segment OCT system, which can be deployed to various clinics throughout the community. We can scan patients using this device, and in doing so, we can identify patients who have angle closure. These patients are at risk for high intraocular pressure and glaucoma, and so they can be referred to glaucoma specialists for evaluation and potential treatment with laser or surgery. In doing so, this would have a number of benefits. First, it would reduce the number of doctor's visits for patients who in fact do not have angle closure 
and who do not need to be evaluated by glaucoma specialists. This in turn would reduce healthcare costs and by reducing the number of cases of angle closure glaucoma would also greatly reduce the costs associated with glaucoma care. However, most importantly, this type of method could prevent permanent vision loss that is associated with angle closure glaucoma. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd just like to thank all the members of my lab who have worked very hard on all of these studies, in particular, Michael Chang, who is a computer scientist and lead research assistant in my lab, who was the one who developed all of these artificial intelligence algorithms. Also, here's a picture of the clinical research space that is right next to where many of you come to see me and in the Keck School of Medicine. And the next time that you're here, if you're interested, I'm happy to give you a tour uh, of our laboratory space. Again, thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested in hearing more about my research uh, or helping to support my research, you can feel free to reach out to Sylvia and she can provide you with more information. Thank you very much again for attending. At this point, I'm gonna answer just a few questions that have come in. Okay. So the first question here is, are there any vitamins or nutritional supplements for glaucoma? This is a really good question and one that I'm commonly asked. Unfortunately, there aren't any vitamins or nutritional supplements that have been shown to be effective in glaucoma. However, there are some lifestyle modifications that have been shown to be beneficial. One of these modifications includes a mild amount of aerobic exercise in order to maintain cardiovascular health. Another modification is the consumption of green leafy vegetables, which are high in nitrates. These have a positive effect in the outflow of aqueous humor from the eye, and therefore can be useful for patients who have glaucoma. Another question is, is there anything that can be done to regenerate the optic nerve? Uh, this is also an excellent question and one that I'm frequently asked. Unfortunately, regeneration of the optic nerve is very challenging. The optic nerve is an ex uh, essentially an extension of the central nervous system of the brain. And as we know, we don't have any way of regenerating the complex neural circuitry in the brain. There are currently efforts to regenerate the optic nerve, but this work is only in the preliminary phases and it will be most likely several decades before we have anything promising uh, that can be tested on humans. So I think this also highlights the importance of this current work uh, in terms of preventing glaucoma, because currently prevention of glaucoma is the only way that we can mitigate the uh, effects of vision loss related to glaucoma. All right, I think that's all the questions that we've received today, but certainly if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to Sylvia and I would be happy to set up a time to chat with you and answer those questions at a later time. Thank you all very much again for showing interest in my research and for attending this webinar today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.